from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and I am the host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. Special thanks to some of my patrons, of course. John, my girl Judy, David, Bree, Brandy, Cassandra, Gaylin, Gabrielle, Emily, Emma, Nanette, Sophie, Sarah, Teresa, Florence, Robert, Katerina, Hammer, Janice, Freddie, Sam, and Catherine. Thank you so, so much. You are truly appreciated. Now, today's podcast is going to be on Tommy Lynn Sells, and this comes with a large disclaimer because he did some pretty messed up things, okay? It gets pretty dark, and this one also came very highly requested, so I thought I'd better go ahead and get to it. So, Tommy Lynn Sells was born on June 28th, 1964 in Oakland, California. So, let's get into some history for that time. Three North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked the U.S. destroyer Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin. After the U.S. Congress authorized the war against North Vietnam, this led to the Tonkin Gulf Resolution that was passed by the U.S. Congress, giving President Lyndon B. Johnson the authorization to use military force in Southeast Asia without a formal declaration of war by Congress. The year before, President John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. So in 1964, the Warren Commission was put together to report on the assassination, which concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone and with no known motive. The commission also reported that the Secret Service had not made adequate preparations for the president's visit in Dallas, Texas. President Johnson also signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which made it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their race, religion, sex, national origin, or the color of their skin. It also made segregation in public places illegal, access to voting and voter registration. This same year, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize. He donated the prize money to further his civil rights movement. Also this year, the Mariner 4 spacecraft was launched. Its mission was to photograph and study the atmosphere of Mars. It reached Mars the next year and was the first successful mission to reach the red planet and provide images of another planet from deep space. The first Beatles album was released this year. Work began on the Oswan Dam by diverting the Nile River to a man-made canal. The UK and France announced they were to build a tunnel under the English Channel. The UK abolished the death penalty. And Nelson Mandela was among eight people sentenced to life in prison in South Africa. The Summer Olympics were held in Japan in 1964 and Austria hosted the Winter Olympics. And last, but certainly not least, 1964 was the year that the Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, was captured. So this was the atmosphere that Tommy was born into. Now his mother, Nina Jean Woodall, was born in April of 1934 in what we natives of Missouri call the boot heel in a town called Holcomb. Her parents, Fred and Sybil, were both born and raised in that area as well. And this area has a rich past. Holcomb grew from the old St. Louis and Gulf Railroad. The town itself was named after its first sheriff, Lewis Holcomb, and had its first official post office in 1886, though the area had been settled long before that. 
The boot heel itself was established in 1794 along the new Madrid fault line, which is actually due to blow at any time, I believe. So you can understand why we pay attention to that. Now, this area of Missouri used to primarily grow wheat due to the soggy, swampy nature of the local environment, but it was eventually changed over to cotton. During the Civil War, a number of battles occurred in this area, but you know, overall, life is pretty quiet there. People work the land and they enjoy their simple existence. Now, the story about his biological father, well, it simply isn't there. One of my more reliable sources, Radford University, just stated, quote, parents' marital status, married, but not to the biological father. Now, his mother, Nina, had four other siblings, Peggy and Jimmy Woodall, both younger than her. But she also had two half-brothers from her mother, Mike and Dennis. I wasn't able to find really much of anything about Nina's early life. She did go on to marry William Sells, who was an insurance salesman. When she was 20 years old, she gave birth to her first child, a son that she named Terry Joe. Soon after Terry came another boy, Timothy Lee. At some point, Nina and William had moved to Oakland, California. And I couldn't find if the first two boys had been born in Missouri or California. But what we do know is that Nina got pregnant by another man and gave birth to fraternal twins, Tommy Lynn and Tammy Jean. Now, it was stated in all sources that William was not Tommy and Tammy's biological father. Regardless, William allowed himself to be legally labeled as their father. But then there was some drama there, too. This is all based on stories that Tommy told, but supposedly, William ran into some serious financial problems and a man named Joe Lovins, who all sources believe was his actual biological father, bailed William out. Joe was a car salesman as well as a gambler who used the debt that William owed against him to force him to say that he was the twins' father. This is all according to the book Through the Window by Diane Fanning. Apparently, Joe Levins' motto, which Tommy kept and used later, was, quote, dead men tell no tales, end quote. And then here again is where some sources vary. Some say the family moved back to Missouri when Tommy and his twin sister Tammy were still very small toddlers. Other sources say that by the time the twins were born, Nina was a single mother now with four children. She would go on to have three more boys after the twins. Another set of twins named Jerry Kevin and Jimmy Keith, and then finally Randy Jean. And then when the twins were only 18 months old, both contracted spinal meningitis. According to the site meningitisnow.org, the common signs and symptoms of meningitis in babies and toddlers are fever, cold hands and feet, discontentment, rapid breathing or grunting, unusual cry or moaning, refusing food, vomiting, drowsy and floppy, unresponsiveness, tense or bulging soft spot on the head, stiff neck, light sensitivity, and even convulsions and seizures. Babies and toddlers are at a marked increased risk because their immune systems are not developed enough to handle the infection. The common causes were listed as bacteria and viruses, but roughly 10% will not survive. In Tommy's case, Tammy lost her life to the infection, but Tommy lived. And then another variation in the sources is when the family, including William, returned to Missouri and they settled in St. Louis, or if Tommy was just sent back to Missouri to live with a relative of Nina's. Regardless, not long after his health returned, he was sent to live with his Aunt Bonnie, who still lived in Holcomb. So from 1966 to 1969, between the ages of two to five years old, Tommy lived with Bonnie, and it was said that his mother basically abandoned him. She did not come to visit him, though she herself was living in St. Louis, just a three hours drive away. Then when he was five years old, Bonnie told Nina that she would really like to adopt Tommy, and immediately Nina refused and demanded Tommy be sent back to her, to which he was. 
Nina then refused to let Tommy visit with Bonnie ever after that. Bonnie would later go on to say that Tommy was very happy and healthy during his time with her. She said he loved to ride his tricycle around on the sidewalk and stated he wanted to be a fireman when he grew up. This is the time in his very young life and the only time that he actually knew peace and happiness. So once back with his mother, he received little to no attention from Nina. He was enrolled in school, but by the time he was seven years old, he was skipping school more often than he was going. Though the school tried to communicate with his mother, she showed complete indifference. His grandmother and grandfather kept alcoholic beverages around and Tommy used to sneak and drink, already abusing alcohol at the tender age of seven. His mother was quoted as saying, quote, He was the kind of child that whatever you wanted him to do, he was going to make sure he did not do it. Going to school was one of those things, end quote. When he was eight years old, he later said he began spending time with a man named Willis Clark, who nearly immediately began to try to win him over and groom him. He would take him to play pool and spent money, time, and attention on young Tommy, which, of course, he would enjoy. These short visits turned into staying for a couple of days. Nina would go on to say that every time she would insist that he come home, Tommy would throw a huge fit, a temper tantrum, until she agreed to let him stay. Now, Tommy, on the other hand, states that he was encouraged to stay with this man by his mother. And these visits would last longer and longer until he was nearly living with Willis. Now, Willis would give Tommy some pocket money, and in return, he had to let Willis, well, do things to him. You see, the man was a pedophile who sexually assaulted Tommy for years. It was said that Willis usually always had a group of boys hanging around his house. Then, eventually, Willis raped Tommy, though Tommy says that he actually allowed it, but it really confused him and he felt like it screwed him up. In 1974, at 10 years old, Tommy began smoking marijuana and he completely dropped out of school. The next year, Joe Lovins, who again was believed to be his biological father, died. Tommy later said that this upset him greatly and that he was basically told to just get over it. At 13 years old, Tommy had been staying with his maternal grandmother, off and on between him being with Willis. Now one night as she slept, Tommy, who was naked, climbed into bed with her. She said, quote, you'd better get your ass out of this bed and stop this shit, end quote. He did as he was told, but not long after, Tommy was back at Willis's and he left Willis's house and walked over to his family's trailer to visit. But he found that the door was locked and as he peered through the window, he saw that the trailer was empty. He said, quote, no one was there. Nothing was there besides the trailer. They moved. She met a man from Michigan and they got married. Everyone moved to Michigan. No, I'll see you later. No, bye. No, nothing. End quote. So he walked back to Willis's house. It is important to note that no one else in his family has corroborated this story yet. So days after he stated that he had been abandoned again, he allegedly pistol whipped a woman to unconsciousness because she had made him angry. After this, he was completely on his own. At 14 years old, he left the area, riding trains around the country, trying to work odd jobs and stealing when needed. In 1979, when he was 15 years old, he later claimed to have committed his first murder. He said that he had decided to rob a house, and once he was inside, he claimed to have witnessed the male owner sexually assaulting a young boy, so he killed him. The next year, at 16 years old, he claims he was near a Chinese restaurant in Los Angeles where he killed a man with an ice pick. He then traveled up to Oakland where he got into a fight with some gang members, nearly killing another man and getting pretty seriously injured himself. 
He went to the local hospital, and when the nurses explained to him that they would have to insert a catheter into him, well, he flew into a rage, yelling profanities at them. He walked out, and he hitchhiked all the way back to his mother's house. He really wanted her to nurse him back to health. So while at his mother's house recuperating, he apparently got into the shower with his mother, who then screamed at him and beat him until he fled the house. He was then admitted on an outpatient basis at the Community Mental Health Clinic in Jonesboro, Arkansas, which is actually very close to the boot heel of Missouri, on grounds of attempting to sexually assault his own mother. Now, he told the doctors that he didn't know who he was anymore and that he didn't understand why he had tried to do that with his own mother. They observed him and concluded that he was an angry, violent young man. In 1982, he was living in Arkansas with a girl named Cindy Hanna, who he claimed was his first love. Of course, her family was very much against the relationship, the main reason being that he had stolen money from their church. Regardless, Cindy became pregnant and they had a son together. A few months later, a man matching Tommy's description was seen fleeing the home of the Gill family. The father, mother, and their four-year-old daughter were found beaten to death the next day. And this was his childhood, guys, so let's get into it. There seemed to be quite a lot of drama around his birth with regards to who his biological father was. It seems like it was just sort of known that Joe had been his father, but it was never fully acknowledged. And this, of course, with the massive gray area with that, would be quite confusing to any child. He and his twin sister both developed spinal meningitis. Now, the long-term effects of this, when suffered in infancy, is associated with learning and memory deficits, cognitive deficiencies, and sensory motor impairments, including hearing and vision loss, motor dysfunction, and up to one-third of survivors suffer transient or permanent deafness or other neurological problems such as the literal death of cells in the hippocampus, which is kind of known as the seahorse of the brain. This particular part of the brain is in charge of learning and memory and can be easily damaged by a variety of stimuli. And then he lost his twin sister to the illness. They were both only 18 months old, and while he claims that the loss was unbearable, I'm sure it would have been quite upsetting, but being that young, I'm not entirely convinced that he would have had any memory of the occurrence unless someone were constantly bringing up the subject, which is possible. While his mother was grieving the loss of her only daughter after seven children, he was sent to live with his aunt. This would be the most stable home he would ever know, and then he was ripped from it by his mother when she discovered the aunt wanted to adopt him. Such an upheaval and uprooting, if you will, would indeed have a negative effect. Then we have the Willis-Clark situation. Due to lack of supervision and what is at least clear to me a disinterest in her own child, Tommy was left in the care of Mr. Clark, who was later to be proven an actual pedophile. While his mother stated Tommy demanded to be left there, Tommy stated that she encouraged it. Regardless, he was molested and sexually assaulted by this man from the age of eight until he was 13 years old. So the consequences of sexual assault in children impacts them for the rest of their lives. The immediate psychological consequences of this type of abuse include shock, fear, anxiety, guilt, post-traumatic stress disorder, denial, confusion, withdrawal, isolation, and so much more. And these experiences are known to be a major risk factor in developing long-term psychological and social adjustment problems that persist throughout their lives. So once these children grow into adolescence, the sexual abuse affects them, showing as neurobiological changes, depressive symptoms, delinquency, alcohol and drug use, which we see with Tommy, gang involvement, which we see with Tommy, 
self-harm, self-destructive behavior, high-risk sexual behavior, and sexual behavior problems, such as getting in bed with your grandmother or in the shower with your mother, early sexual initiation, eating disorders, the list goes on and on. So for the lucky few of us that experienced it in both childhood and adolescence, well, then that intensifies. The emphasis that I'm more familiar with is the post-traumatic stress disorder, which we all know is a reactive disorder that stems from a traumatic event experienced that involves a threat and or harm to a person's physical and or psychological integrity. The immediate response to the event involves intense fear, helplessness, or horror. Symptoms are split into three categories. One, re-experiencing the symptoms or reliving the trauma over and over through flashbacks and nightmares, which is horrific, I must say. The second is avoidance, and my subcategory of avoidance is dissociation. And then the third is hyperarousal, or always being on alert and hypervigilant, even when there is no danger. And yeah, I got that one too. So then when they become adults, the suffering from sexual abuse can manifest as somatic problems, poorer physical health, poorer perception of physical health, chronic illness, which I have, chronic pain, mental health problems, yeah, psychological distress, dissociation, suicidal thoughts, fear of intimacy, and the list again is really long. So long story short, keep your damn hands off children. So then Tommy escalated into full violence, claiming to have murdered at least three people before he was 18 years old. Some argue whether or not these murders occurred, but we do know that he at least had it within him to do so, considering what we know he did later. All in all, he desperately wanted love and approval from the mother who abandoned him more than once. He had always felt unwanted and unloved. He was made to believe all of the problems surrounding him, even if they didn't really involve him, were his fault. He lost his twin sister, though he was barely a toddler, but still would have been a devastating loss. He was sexually assaulted by a known pedophile and his mother didn't protect him. And there was also what he felt was unfinished business with the man he believed to be his father before he died. Serious infantile illness, drugs, alcohol, homelessness, being sexually assaulted. I mean, what, what could possibly go wrong, right? So in the very early 1980s, we know Tommy was in Little Rock, Arkansas. And though he was dating a girl and had a baby with her, he was, let's say, quite popular with the ladies. In fact, his own mother called him her, quote, little whore. He has the gift of gab. He can make any woman believe him. He had more women than Carter had liver pills, end quote. And she's referring to President Carter. So, of course, Nina and her remaining sons, who still lived at home, moved to Arkansas as well. Her newest husband had died, and she was having to work two jobs to be able to support herself and her remaining children. While in Little Rock, Tommy broke into a home and shot the husband who lived there, but thankfully he survived. In 1984, when he was 19 years old, Tommy was arrested for stealing a car. Then he and an accomplice kidnapped a woman from a fast food restaurant where they tortured and raped her, then killed her. Then the men threw her body over the side of a rock quarry. Tommy then found himself back in St. Louis, robbing, killing, and working for the carnival. After being arrested for car theft and being sentenced to two years, he didn't really even serve an entire year of that and then promptly broke his probation. But while in prison, a woman he had been sleeping with had given birth to his daughter. He was arrested not long after for crashing a car after drinking and driving and was kept in prison for two years, being released in May of 1986. At 21 years old and newly free, he began working for Atlas Towing in St. Louis. He stated that he got a call from a sex worker whose car had broken down and asked him to come assist her. 
He arrived where she was and offered to fix her car in exchange for sexual services. She declined his offer, so he shot her and threw her body into a river. He then quickly drove down into Texas and was subsequently hospitalized for overdosing on heroin. Once released from the hospital, he stole a car and drove north, where he later admitted to murdering a 27-year-old woman outside of a Niagara Falls bar. Her remains were found eight years later. Tommy then drove to Nevada, where he was living in October 1987 with a woman named Stephanie. He later confessed to giving her LSD, then strangling her to death. He said he then tied concrete blocks to her feet and disposed of her in a hot spring in the desert. Her remains were never found. He left after and headed back east, and while traveling through Illinois, a man named Keith spotted Tommy hitchhiking and offered to take him in for a hot meal. For Keith's selflessness and generosity, Tommy shot him, then mutilated his genitals. He then killed Keith's three-year-old son with a hammer, then began to attack Keith's pregnant wife. Strong disclaimer here. The stress of this attack caused her to go into early labor where she gave birth to a baby girl. He then beat both of them with a bat. Neither survived. This crime was unsolved until Tommy confessed to it 12 years later. The next year, while in Salem, New Hampshire, Tommy approached a woman in a convenience store parking lot where he lured her away. He sexually assaulted her, strangled her, and left her body laying on some railroad tracks. Again, he traveled and crisscrossed throughout the continental United States, leaving bodies in his wake. A fight over a rolled joint left a homeless man with a slit throat. He was even arrested for assault in 1988, but was then released as the victim was entirely too terrified to press charges. In 1989, he hired a sex worker back in Nevada, only to realize that they were male instead of female, and he murdered them. He murdered two more after going up to Oregon, then charged with theft back down in Arkansas, released, fled to Nevada again, arrested again and sent to a detox facility for 30 days. In early 1990, he was back to stealing vehicles and robbing people. Finally, in 1991, he was picked up in Wyoming for public intoxication and stealing a vehicle and was sentenced to two years in a Wyoming prison. He was released in May of 1992 and he was now 27 years old. He quickly left for Charleston, West Virginia, where a young woman saw him hitchhiking, picked him up, and again took him home, fed him, and gave him some fresh clothing. He rewarded her selflessness and kindness by savagely raping and then stabbing her. Now, she managed to get the knife away from him and actually caused quite a bit of damage to him herself, but He grabbed her piano bench and bludgeoned her until he believed her to be dead. Thankfully, she survived. So in June of 1993, Tommy was actually arrested and convicted of, quote, malicious wounding in the Charleston, West Virginia case. The rape charge was dropped, though, and he was sentenced to serve two to ten years. While in prison, he married a woman named Nora Price and was also diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Then, after only serving four years of his sentence, he was released on parole. He and Nora moved to Tennessee, though he often abandoned her completely to travel the country again. He would briefly work in carnivals again as a Ferris wheel operator and then occasionally a truck driver. While in Del Rio, Texas, he met a mother of four, Jessica, and he moved in with her after a very short time. The next month, his wife Nora gave birth to another son while she was in Jonesboro, Arkansas, but she put the child up for adoption. Now, while in this area, he hit a bit closer to my chunk of the state of Missouri. 
In 1997, it is strongly believed that Tommy murdered a 13-year-old girl in Springfield. According to the Springfield News Leader, her body was found by deer hunters in a farmer's pond. She had been missing for more than a month. He is also linked to two more murders close to Branson, Missouri, roughly 10 years before this, where Tommy had been working at a carnival in the area at the exact same time. Now, with the back and forth, he and Jessica decided to get married, even though it was obviously not legal because he was still married to Nora. In April of 99, Tommy later confessed to murdering a woman and her eight-year-old daughter by stabbing them to death in Tennessee. The next month, he raped and murdered a 13-year-old girl in Lexington, Kentucky, stealing her bicycle and selling it for $20. He immediately went on to strangle a nine-year-old girl after he kidnapped her from an outdoor fair. He dumped her little body in a drainage ditch. In May of 99, at 34 years old, Tommy was arrested in Wisconsin for public drunkenness and threatening harm with a box knife. Unfortunately, he was released shortly after. The next year, he went back to Del Rio and Jessica, bringing her children with her, moved back in with him. That July, he abducted a 14-year-old girl in Oklahoma where he sexually assaulted her, then shot her as she tried to escape. Her body was found four months later. In December of 99, he later stated he murdered again in Oklahoma, killing a couple, taking their daughter and a friend who had spent the night, setting their house on fire, then murdering the two girls and dumping their bodies by the Red River, which separates Oklahoma and Texas. So on December 31st, 1999, when the rest of us were worried about Y2K, Tommy went to a suburb of Del Rio. He entered into a home, then sexually assaulted a 13-year-old girl, and then stabbed her to death. He then slit the throat of a 10-year-old little girl and left. Now, the 10-year-old girl managed to get to a neighbor's house, having to walk a quarter of a mile to get there with her trachea nearly severed. The girl received treatment and was able to describe her attacker. A sketch artist was brought in and drew a sketch and Tommy was identified from it and was promptly arrested. He was charged with the murder of the first girl and the attempted murder of the other and eventually sentenced to death. While on death row, he confessed to up to 70 murders in total since he was a teenager. He was now 36. The authorities believe him to have made up some of his confessions, but how are we ever really going to know? So Tommy Lynn Sells was executed on April 3rd, 2014 by lethal injection at the Texas State Penitentiary in Huntsville. He made no final statement and was pronounced dead 13 minutes later. Some of the victim's families attended his execution. So he is believed to actually have antisocial personality disorder with schizoid features. Most of us already know that this is often referred to as sociopathy, but it is a mental disorder in which the person regularly shows no regard for right or wrong and ignores the rights and feelings of others. These people tend to antagonize, manipulate, and treat other people with callous indifference. They show no guilt or remorse for their behavior. They often violate the law, they lie, behave violently and impulsively, often abuse substances, and so on. With the add-on of schizoid features, we see people who avoid social activities and tend to shy away from interacting with others. They have a more limited range of emotional expression. They come off as loners, dismissive to others, lack the desire or skill to form close personal relationships, and so on. And in my opinion, I think this is a pretty fair assessment of Tommy. While I'm not trying to condone or promote any level of sympathy for him, his childhood does give us at least some insight as to why he went on to be the very dangerous man he became. 
And as always, respect to the victims. We in this community tell these stories not only to educate, tell the story, and entertain, but also so that the victims are not forgotten. But tell me guys, what do you think? You can leave me a comment below if you're watching and all of my contact information is in the notes below. And thank you so, so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I truly appreciate that. Thank you and have a good day.